This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, episode number 265, recorded on December 27th, 2013. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. Joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. How's it going up there in Western MA? Oh, it's going pretty well. It's uh, warmed up a little bit today, so the little dusting of snow that we got has, has melted off the driveway, which was nice. Didn't have to shovel anything. It's weird, weird weather we're having, warm and then cold. Yeah, yeah, and then it's supposed to, we're supposed to get some rain, and then it's supposed to be ridiculously cold for around New Year's, I think. It's four degrees C right here uh, with sunny skies. Yeah, we've got two, de- two degrees C, four, 36 Fahrenheit, and... Uh, sunny here too. Well, I'm at home today, as you can see uh, from the stuff behind me. I've decided not to commute into Manhattan till next year. <laughs> so, <laughs> Good idea. Well, also joining us today from Ann Arbor, Michigan, Kathy Spindler. Hi, everybody. Kathy. Hey there. How's it's, the weather out there? It's nice. It's 36 or 37 here, same Celsius as uh, Ellen Allen has, and light, almost sunny skies, but some clouds and blue, light blue. And uh, we don't, uh, we still have a, a major amount of snow on the grass from the past, but it's going to be melting soon. So it's, what's that championship t-shirt you got there? Which, which championship is Oh, that? this is uh, Wimbledon. Wimbledon, wow. Yeah, oh. yeah. Did you, did I went you... in 1995, I went. Who was yeah. playing? Oh, uh, uh, several different famous tennis <laughs> players. <laughs> oh, I was there on Middle Saturday, so stayed up, uh, stayed overnight in the park, and then was able to uh, get a seat on center court. And a lot of people partied overnight, and so I could look across the stands in Wimbledon and see them all snoozing through the tennis <laughs> match. Nice. So I managed to stay awake, though. Also joining us today, normally from North Central Florida, but. Today in Oregon somewhere, Rich Condit. Hi, everybody. Hey there, Rich. How are you doing? Where are you, in or- northwest Oregon? I am in, I guess you'd call it kind of, sort of, central Oregon. Kind of, sort of. It's uh, <laughs> so, just south uh, central Oregon? <laughs> it's, it's on the east foothills of the Cascade Range. So it's high desert, 30 miles, eh, 20 miles south of Bend in a resort town called Sun River. Have I have done? actually podcasted. I've done TWIV from here once before, I think. You've done any skiing yet? Oh, yeah. Well, well, we've been skiing two days. The snow's not great. All right? It, 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 there's uh, not much snow, but, uh, I mean, so the base is kind of... Uh, one of the um, uh, staff there described the base as bulletproof. <laughs> 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 so it's a little icy. Uh, but they groom it, you know, and it turns out okay. It's great. Uh, the weather, it's been beautiful. It's 24 Fahrenheit, which is minus 4C, and uh, nice and sunny. So it's been beautiful conditions for uh, skiing. I'll send you a, I'm going to take a photo op from, we're going tomorrow, from the top of the mountain, and I'll be sure to send you that and so you can drool over it. It's beautiful. Well, thanks, everybody, for, for doing this today. Uh, we're recording this on a Google Hangout because I'm at home and I don't have my normal equipment and it's really easy to do it this way. So if you're just listening to the audio, it may sound a bit different, but uh, we'll also have a video released for this as well. So maybe that would make up for it. Anyway, today we're going to do our end of the year 10 virology story episodes, which I guess we've been doing now... Uh, for for as many years as we've been doing to have kind of became a uh, tradition. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Not not exact not just ten episodes but ten topics. I think we, we broadened yeah, it to ten that. Ten topics. We did broaden it, <clears throat> and um, 
I polled actually our fans over on facebook.com slash this week in virology and I got a couple of suggestions from them but before we do that I just want to kind of summarize the year we did we released 52 episodes in uh, 2013 so we were pretty much one every week I don't think we took a single week off in terms of releasing an episode so we started with number 214, and this is number two, 265, which will be the last for 2013. Unfortunately, we only did two Virology 101 episodes all year long. <laughs> Sorry, everybody. <laughs> Oops. We ought to do uh, more Virology 101 episodes. Hey, that could be a, that could be a title, you know? <laughs> we should do more Virology 101, yes. <laughs> so we'll try and do that. So we got up to translation. That was our last one. So um, the next one would be, I guess, assembly, something like that. We could talk about virus assembly. That would be fun. Mm -hmm. Maybe maybe we have to do a New Year's resolution and say we're going to do that in uh, January. That would be good. <laughs> All right. We did 16 episodes on the road this year. That has to be a record. Yeah. I think so. You know, it's funny. Every year I quote that number and I say, no way it's going to be as many next year, and then it's more. <laughs> I personally flew over 60,000 miles in 2013, mainly twiving and other things like that. Wow. Wow. And I'd like to cut that down a little, but I'm, I am going to Australia next July, so I'll probably have as many miles, because I well, understand it's while, like... For a little while, you're housebound anyway, right? <clears throat> From Monday to Thursday. Yeah. And unless the, except in the summer, of course, because the kids don't go to school in the summer, uh, so I could leave them at home for a few days. We did ten video episodes, including threading the needle, which we released in 2013. Even though we recorded that the year before, uh, by the time it was edited, it came out in 2013. So, um, you know, with this hangout, we could do more video, which some people like. Anything else you guys uh, think I should have pointed out about? Twiv 2013. We yeah. had fun. We yeah. had fun. We learned a lot. Yes. Absolutely. I missed a slug of episodes. I was gone a lot. And I feel I don't feel good about that. It's okay. <laughs> Got reasons to do that. There's no problem. <clears throat> when you're here, you're here. All right, we have one follow up from last week from our pediatrician friend Johnny. Dear Twiv Illuminati, the good Professor Spindler was correct about the pronunciation of my name. It is pronounced Johnny. Thank you. <laughs> cool. Okay. I did not know Julia Child personally, only tangential tangentially. Once I was seated next to her at a beauty salon in Harvard Square, and one of my partners still takes care of the grandchildren of the butcher she used in Cambridge. <laughs> That's as close as I ever got to meeting her. Enjoy rest and renewal over the holidays. Best to you, et al., your Cambridge pediatrician friend, Johnny. Six degrees of Julia Child. Yeah, right. <laughs> I, the reason I brought it up is because I think the day before, my daughter had been watching Julia and... What is the name of that movie? Julie and Julia. Julia right? and Julia, yeah. Or Julia and Julia. I don't remember what order, yeah. And then at the, that movie ends when they move to Cambridge, Massachusetts, so... That's why I asked you. <clears throat> Not that I knew her. For sure I didn't. All right. Ten stories of 2013, no particular order. Uh, this is the rate, the, you know, the, the first one we do isn't, isn't by necessarily the most compelling one. They're all compelling. These are ten of, I don't know, 52 episodes. We usually do two stories per episode, right? So maybe we had about 100 different stories, roughly. Mm -hmm. Something like that. So these are just ten that a we. A lot of them get. A lot of stories get twived more than once because we get updates. That's right. Right, and also we have when we have a guest <laughs> episode, usually it's effectively one story for that episode. All right. So the the, uh, the first one is antiviral RNAi question mark. This is a topic that came up on Twiv two fifty six. How mice say no to virus. Um, but actually, and we also have uh, had an episode before that, our, our um, Austin episode, we talked yeah. about mm -hmm. RNAi with Chris Sullivan, of course. Uh, and then, of course, just a few weeks ago, Ben Tenuver uh, came on and told us about Game of Clones. Um, 
and he, he gave us a nice little background about RNAi in the beginning. Uh, the real question here that's interesting, uh, plants, insects, and worms utilize RNAi as an antiviral. In other words, they, they, they take a, an incoming viral genome, chop it up, chop up the RNA, and then use the little RNAs to target the genome and degrade it or inhibit its translation. And the question is, does that happen in mammalian cells? And the papers we talked about on 256, two different papers from two groups addressed that and provided some evidence that there might be, in fact, an antiviral RNAi response in mammalian cells. Probably, maybe. Yes, probably, probably maybe. Pretty, pretty definitely, probably, maybe. <laughs> maybe. Uh, you know, if you read, so there was a, a comp, there was a review article in I think Cell Host and Microbe, and Ben was one of the co-authors, and they they pointed out a lot of the uh, questions with those papers, which I'm sure will be addressed in the coming year. I'm sure we will revisit this this topic, so we'll see what happens. And and wasn't part of it the fact that the virus that they used in those papers, or at least one of them, was an insect virus, and so there was some thought that, again, that was special because yeah. it was an insect virus that was infecting mammals, or that can infect mammals. That's right. So maybe, so I, that was nodovirus, and they had removed from nodovirus a protein that is known or has been shown to be an antagonist of RNAi, and could therefore show in mammalian cells uh, the production of small RNAs from the viral genome. One of the, one of the criticisms was they didn't actually show that 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 those RNA small RNAs derived from the genome were actually antiviral. They just showed that they were present. Right. Anyway, we'll I'm sure revisit this. I think this is something that starting we've talked about it a lot, but I think for me. It really crystallized in my mind when we did the episode in Austin because Chris Sullivan did a great job of explaining it. And so uh, this is on our radar for sure. Yeah, and this is something that, um, if true, is uh, is pretty important. Um, of you know, whole new whole new potential layer of antiviral innate immunity um, that we maybe inherited from the plants. But, um, of course, if it's not true, it's equally important to figure that out. Sure. I mean, there's always, you know, it's not going to be black and white. There's going to be shades of gray, as always, right? Right. So we'll see what happens. But I would predict this is a story we're going to revisit a number of times in 2014. Oh, finally, we're going to be in an even year, 2014. Have yeah. we never been in an even year? <laughs> it's just for, a year ago. <laughs> over a year ago we were. That's a long time. Have oh, you guys okay. have enjoyed being in a year with 13 in it? I have not. I'm oh, I don't know. care. I don't know. I, don't I, know. I did my graduate work on the 13th floor, which is where you still are, right? I'm not really superstitious, but I'm just happy to get out of the 13th year. And I think <laughs> that's it for me in terms of 13. I'm not going to be here in 2113. <laughs> and you know, I would predict that none of you e are going to be around either. I'm sorry to say. I don't, hope, I don't yeah. mean to depress you, but... Um, <laughs> it's okay. It's not depressing. I'm going to be re-equilibrated with the universe. That's fine with me. I like that. Re-equilibrated. That's good. Very good. You're going to come back as a ferret, Rich. <laughs> <laughs> what a terrible fate. <laughs> Hopefully you'll stay away from Ron Fouchier and yeah. Yoshi Kello. Okay. Yeah, maybe you can weasel out of it. Uh, oh. All right, so that I had selected that one, and the next one uh, I selected was the MERS coronavirus, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus. Yeah, actually, I, wow. I was saying, I was I thought, gee, I'll, I'll get around to picking my TWIF uh, stuff, and then just this morning I was um, reading my email, and I said, oh, Right, today's Friday. We're doing TWIV. I better check. And then I saw these, uh, most of what I was going to pick. Uh, this was one of my picks as well. Yeah, in fact, some uh, I had announced on Facebook, our Facebook page, and this was also picked by one of our listeners. And we did, we talked about this virus on multiple TWIVs, and we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight episodes that someone kindly put here. I presume that's all of them. As far as I know, it is. As I, I was so. going through, I wrote them down. It was starting back in January. Oh, January 13th, 2013. That was the first time we uh, we talked about it. And it actually was an update. I have a feeling we talked about it in 2012. Mm -hmm. 
yeah. as well. But of course, this is a brand new coronavirus. Well, brand new to humans anyway. First identified in the fall of 2012 in a patient in Saudi Arabia. By I would say newly described. Newly yes. described? That yeah, be because for all we know, it's been... You know, it's been around for a while, maybe even causing disease for a while, but I think we're a lot more vigilant than we used to be about Absolutely. these kinds of things. Yes. Absolutely. Yes. yes, we have a lot more specificity on these kinds of things. This is going on with uh, the flu viruses as well. I'm pretty yeah. sure that these little breakthrough events have been happening for eons. Well, something like this virus, which so far is, is known to have infected 170 people with 72 deaths, most of those in uh, Saudi Arabia. Um, I would suspect that this could have happened 50 years ago and no one would have uh, noticed. You know, people die. Right. Most of these patients have been quite ill. And mm -hmm. so it's possible that this would have gone unrecognized. Which is another factor in some of these um, these spillover events, I think. Um, you know, 50, 100 years ago, people didn't get quite ill. Because by the time you got to that point, the medical technology didn't exist to keep you alive. So if you mm -hmm. were, you know, if if you had a, a respiratory disease, well, that was that. Um, you got dead. Yeah, you got dead exactly, and and now you equilibrated with the universe. Equilibrated <laughs> with the universe. <laughs> hey, maybe now, that's that, the... now that people are staying alive, you know, which is great. This this great medical progress, but um, it does mean that we have we have more potentially um, uh, susceptible folks around with compromised yeah. immune systems. Yeah. I was just going to say, Kathy, that's a great show title, and you already put it there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the amazing thing about MERS coronavirus is that so much basic research has been done because there's quite a large coronavirus research community. I, I think uh, there has always been one, and it amplified after SARS coronavirus was identified. Uh, and now it has jumped on MERS coronavirus. They've, they isolated the virus. They sequenced the entire genome. They identified the receptor for the virus. And now, in recent months, there have been a ton of serological surveys to look for antibodies uh, against the virus. And a paper came out recently, which we have not um, talked about on TWIV, which finds uh, not only substantial antibodies in camels in Saudi Arabia, but also uh, the viral genome by polymerase chain reaction. Right. This, this was a My big, money's on the camels. Your money's on the camels. Well, they are racing camels, so you can't yeah. bet on them. <laughs> <laughs> this is a paper, let's see, I think it was in Euro Surveillance. The link is coming up here. No, the Lancet Infectious Diseases. And uh, it's called Middle East Respiratory Syndrome Coronavirus in Dromedary Camels and Outbreak Investigation. So they find high levels of antibodies and then the genome by PCR. No, um, no infectious virus. So they tried to isolate uh, infectious virus from the camels and they weren't able to do so, which I find strange because from patients, we also, it's already been possible to isolate infectious virus. So we know what cells to use and so forth. So. I guess in these camels, the infection was was either almost over or, or over. Was this a little virus? It, if if I were doing this, I would, uh, because there's like eighty or ninety percent seropositivity in these camels. Yeah. Uh, I would want to take to track a whole bunch of camels from birth to seropositivity. Yes and take serial samples on these and I mean if they become seropositive there ought to be a point where you could iso where you could actually uh, isolate virus right. find the infection the, in the Lancet paper how old were the camels they got sequenced from does it say I'm sure it does I can go there I know from other studies that there has been a range of ages of camels uh, that have had an both young and old camels have been shown uh, to have antibodies. Okay, so they so, must get it really young. Yeah, I, they uh, they actually in this study they got samples from 14 camels on a Qatari farm, and not, so this is not Saudi Arabia. I misspoke. Um, and on this farm, someone had recently acquired MERS coronavirus, confirmed uh -huh. laboratory case. So that's why they went to this farm, uh, and. Um, from those 15 camels, I think five of them 
Um, so eight were positive by PCR but could not be confirmed by sequencing. I think a couple um, of the camels were positive. But in, in a separate study, which I don't have in front of me, they have found antibodies in both old and young camels. But you're right, Rich, that would be a good study, which I'm sure is ongoing, to take a cohort of camels and sample them periodically. And as you know, new camels are born or whatever, sample them and trying. I mean, you have to basically establish a chain of infection now. Mm -hmm. um, it turns out that in this case, they have genome sequence from this camel, uh, these camel nucleic acids, viral nucleic acids, but it's so similar to the human sequence that they can't establish a chain of transmission. You know, if you have a, a clear chain of transmission from animals to humans with sufficient nucleotide diversity, you can say, oh, yeah, it came from the camel to the person, but in this case, they can't. So, yeah. again, this is another story we're going to hear a lot about. Meantime, what's the year. status of bats? Because the money was on bats for a while, and yet the evidence uh, for bats was mm, slim. Yeah, the evidence for bats was 190 nucleotide PCR fragment. Uh, and I not a whole lot of seropositivity, right? No. Or none, well, even, right? I believe I so. I think the problem is it's a lot easier to get sera from camels than uh, it is from bats, or anything from bats, right? So uh, that's why the, the, the camel work is progressing more rapidly. But uh, I understand that people are still looking very hard in bats in the area, so we'll probably hear about that at some point. I'm sure we'll hear a lot more about this. Yeah. Now, I, w I would, and we have said this before, I don't think this virus is going global, um, but clearly they should identify the source so they can stop the infections because you don't want people to keep getting ill uh, over and over again in, in something that you could prevent. There is human-to-human -human transmission, but it's flaky, requires really close contact, and not all close contacts get it. Right. 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 Okay. Next one was your pick, Rich. Mm-hmm. Well, I, this to me, actually, Kathy points out, okay, so this is the uh, human placental trophoblasts uh, confer viral resistance. So Kathy points out that, in fact, this paper was more or less highlighted in 2012 because we had Carolyn Coyne on TWIV, uh, at ASV, and she talked about this work. But in 2013, the actual paper was published, and we covered the paper in episode 241. Uh, and this, to me, was absolutely one of the most unique and most fascinating stories that, I, for me, that I've heard since TWIV started. Um, and that is the observation that uh, uh, placental trophoblasts um, uh, make exosomes that are full of microRNAs that when delivered to target cells um, induce autophagy and make those cells resistant to viruses, uh, which uh, provides a mechanism for inhibiting transplacental uh, infection by viruses during uh, pregnancy, and I just found that fascinating. Do we know the target of these um, microRNAs? Uh, I don't. I think Carolyn may have known uh, a couple of these, but uh, it uh, I don't know right now. She has a review in Placenta, which is a good journal to publish this, Yes. In uh, November of this year, called Placenta Specific MicroRNA and Exosomes Good Things Come in Nano Packages. Uh, so, yeah, they don't, they still don't have, it's on, the microRNAs come from chromosome 19. But what they're There's a whole bundle of them that uh, I guess it was known that these microRNAs are induced in pregnancy before. So they, yeah. they were recognized. That, uh, and part of this paper is putting the whole thing together to recognize that they're actually packaged in exosomes and delivered and autophagy is induced. Right. So. Right. Yeah, this is a great story. Great I like, story. I like yeah, that. Yeah, neat stuff. I'm sure we'll hear more about that as well. The cool thing about that, Rich, is that she got interested in this when she was pregnant and right. started thinking, why am I not getting all kinds of infections? 
how is how is the fetus protected? And from that came this very cool result. I heard, heard I, I recall her describing a story on ASV as sitting culturing virus at the hood, pregnant next to her, I guess technician, who mm -hmm. was also culturing virus pregnant, and they kind of look at each other and say, um, is this okay? <laughs> Should we be doing this? Should we be doing this? <laughs> right. And that precipitated the whole thing. And then the other gag was finding a placental biologist at their institution. Where uh, where are they? Is this uh, at Pittsburgh yeah. University? Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh. Yeah. And uh, saying, um, can we get some placental material? And the guy saying, yeah, bring a bucket. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Great source of uh, tissue. Right. So I I think this is another story we're going to see more of. Yes. Uh, because there's a lot to do here, and I think other people, as as with any good story, other people will get interested and pursue it and uh, and amplify it. And yeah, and, and you know why isn't this mechanism on everywhere all the time? And yeah, yep. a bunch of yep. bunch of questions. Right. right. All right. Story number four is another one that you picked, Rich. Right. Uh, this was uh, reticuloendotheliosis virus. I was going to pick uh, this one too, actually. So, yes. oh, oh, you get you you can co-pick it with me. Okay, yes, Alan, that's fine. <laughs> I'm sure that if we all uh, ranked our ten, that we'd have probably six of them in common. Lots of overlap. Oh, yes. Yes. yes um, so, uh, as a matter of fact, I may need help uh, reconstructing this because it's really confusing. I'll that's do what I can. <laughs> this was a combination, sort of phylogenetic and literature analysis that uh, traced the origins of a retrovirus that can now be found in the wild that causes a disease in birds called reticuloendotheliosis and it traced it back to what the 30s I yeah. think mm -hmm. to the Bronx Zoo um, and the isolation in the zoo of a uh, plasmodium um, that was used for a couple of decades as a model for malaria until better, better models came along. But apparently at some point along the way that plasmodium became uh, contaminated with or maybe was originally contaminated with, we don't know because the material is lost, with this uh, reticuloendotheliosis virus and was cultured in um, laboratories that were also in the business of making uh, vaccines for foul pox. Um, and uh, so the vaccines became contaminated and contaminated in a really weird way. I think there's not only contamination with virus independent of the uh, pox virus uh, vaccine, but there is, since it's a retrovirus and can integrate, there is proviral DNA integrated into the foul pox DNA. Yes, uh, and, and also a herpes vaccine. virus. Uh, and also, a, that's right, Marek's disease, I think. It's apparently pulled vaccine. this trick twice. Yeah. Right. Um, and as these vaccines uh, were introduced into the wild, so was the reticuloendotheliosis virus. So this is uh, an example of a an inadvertent uh, human mediated introduction of a virus, this reticuloendotheliosis virus, into the wild. Though it probably existed in the wild somewhere to get in the plasmodium in the first place. Uh, but in terms of um, its current mm, circulation in birds, a lot of it is thought to be sourced originally from these experiments with this plasmodium. Yeah. Fascinating story. So, so they were actually what what led them into this. They were they were just doing um, sequences to look at retroviruses in um, in mammals, and they uh, um, they came across this uh, very closely or a virus closely related to these bird viruses or what were thought to be bird viruses, and they started doing the phylogenetic tree, and that led to this whole string of discoveries that well. This probably was, it actually, it helped me a lot to kind of put this, to, to reorder the events. Because mm -hmm. um, if you look at it in the order in which things were discovered, it's very convoluted. Mm -hmm. um, but but the, the outline of it is that apparently um, 
this these reticuloendotheliosis viruses um, evolved in mammals tens of millions of years ago. Um, and then there's this event, uh, fast forward to uh, the 1930s, people are looking for a, a malaria strain that they can, they can use in the lab, in a, in a lab model, and they settle on this plasmodium um, that they isolated from uh, a bird in the Bronx Zoo, right? Yeah, right. it was a guinea hen, some a guinea Borneo hen. guinea right. hen or something like that. Fire, right. Firebacked pheasant. Mm -hmm. Oh, okay. Thank you, Kathy. Firebacked pheasant. Right. And I think the, the mammalian viruses that they found in this initial survey were from that same part of the world, right? Yes, that's from, correct. I yeah. believe so. They were looking in Malagasy. Mm -hmm. Is that the okay. same part of the world? I think so. I think so, yeah. It's Southeast Southeast Asia or... Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, so that, that stock... Uh, then turned out to have this virus which can infect birds in it. Um, but people didn't figure that out for 20 years. And meanwhile, they made all this vaccine and, you know, spread this stuff around. Um, what's not clear is how that bird picked up this virus or if that's where the virus got into the plasmodium prep. Yeah, the, the pox virologists have been aware of this retrovirus integrated into the foul pox genome in some stra vaccine strains of uh, Falpox for uh, uh, quite a number of years, but it's uh, never been clear at all where it came from. And now, uh, according to this, it looks like it's basically inadvertently uh, uh, vectored by humans. Right. So we somehow we got it. I mean, we, we got this bird in the Bronx Zoo that had it and the plasmodium that we wanted. Um, ended up inoculating a bunch of birds with this, and at some point, possibly in that process, this retrovirus integrated itself into a couple of DNA viruses, which has caused it to spread further. <laughs> it's a great story, absolutely great yeah. story. One weird. So this, little, we. I was just gonna say one weird little fact that I, I turned up because they they sequenced uh, mongooses, ring-tailed and narrow-striped mongooses and evidently there's some controversy among the taxonomists as to whether th there are more than one subfamily of mongoose um, and the two subfamilies are the herpes today or galidine so it's just kind of a weird coincidence that there's a family of mongooses that has herpes in its name just mm -hmm. had to give you that little factoid that's in that's interesting so yeah, we uh, I, we kind of lump this in with a couple of other examples that we've come up with of inadvertently human facilitated uh, circulation of viruses. One of which was this idea that um, HIV got a boost from vaccine programs in uh, Africa that didn't properly use properly sterilized needles, and I forget what the others were. Yeah, I don't recall offhand, but there are certainly examples of things being in biologicals that we didn't know about, like right. SV40 and the polio vaccine mm -hmm. and circoviruses and rotavirus vaccines. Uh, and then, of course, XMRV, which is a total uh, uh, artifactual recombinant uh, virus uh, resulting from... Uh, culturing, uh, passaging uh, tissues through mice, right? Which which never got into people, as far as we know. Right. right. Yeah. But and still. just a, a quick correction on geography. Um, Malagasy is the the language of people of Madagascar. Um, oh, it's so, not the same place. Is yeah. It? So it's. I, mean, I was thinking for some reason I had that confused with Malaysia, and mm -hmm. yeah. So the the uh, which part of this the. Um, uh, the investigation that they were doing in mammals that led to this whole string of discoveries was in Madagascar. The um, bird at the Bronx Zoo was from uh, Borneo, which is in Malaysia, which is on the other side of the Indian Ocean. Yeah, I think the, the Bronx Zoo connection is that Traeger, well, this, this strain of malaria had been isolated from the, the Borneo fireback pheasant in the Bronx Zoo. 
And then Bill Traeger, who worked on malaria at Rockefeller, uh, found that there was an agent in the stalks of his Plasmodium lofurae that caused anemia. And in 1959, he identified that as spleen necrosis virus, which is another member of this uh, REV sort of grouping of retroviruses. And so I think that's what put these investigators onto the Bronx Zoo. If anybody is interested in just having a, a a blast of Dixon, you could go listen to that twiv because he talked a lot about the Lofuri and the, yes. some of the people oh, you yeah. just mentioned. Really good stories. Yeah. All right, story number five is a, a pick of Kathy's. So this is the story about the uh, T7 cryoelectron tomography and cryoelectron micro microscopy and the tomography is just cryo EM but in three dimensions and what they did was figure out that T7 which is one of these tailed phages and we've always pictured it with the tails uh, fibers and things hanging down that the actual structure is with those tail fibers mostly folded up around the capsid and then uh, occasionally one or more of those can fold down, they're kind of dynamic, and that either the tail fiber or the capsid head itself contacts the surface of the E. coli, which is the host for this bacteriophage, and then uh, it can kind of randomly walk along until it finds the receptor that it wants, and then it uh, starts its uh, injection process, but what it does is put a whole bunch of its tail right in through the cell and make the passageway into the cell. So uh, it was just a really cool picture. It's kind of a refutation of everything that we ever thought about those phages swimming around with their tails hanging behind them. And um, I just the the change in that image for me was was really striking. It, correct me if I'm wrong, but there were a couple of uh, uh, interesting things, uh, uh, other interesting things about that as well. As I recall, the base plate of that phage has five-fold rotational symmetry. But there's six tail fibers. Am, am I, I remembering that correct? I, yeah, I do remember that. And uh, I think there's some the sort of symmetrical of issue like that. And the high resolution uh, structure that they got uh, helps understand how that can happen. And that is, I think, a fairly. Uh, uh, that translates to a number of these other phages. Yeah, I was thinking about this. Uh, the other day, and the, uh, the the word stagger came to mind. The, the virus kind of staggers across the surface of the cell until a couple of tail fibers make contact, and then I that my recollection is that that kind of precipitates the release of the rest of the tail fibers, and they all come down. So now we have a, a stable contact, and then the and then the tube comes out of the uh, middle of the phage and penetrates the cell and injects the DNA. Fascinating process. Great pictures. Yeah, great right. stuff. So, You're, Kathy and, and Rich, what was there evidence that led people to draw phages with the tails hanging down, or was that just something that... Well, you know, there's that old uh, uh, picture. Who took the... We encountered this the other day. Who took the famous EM of phage T4 with the DNA all spilled out of the head? Oh. It's funny you, you should ask that because I'm wearing a, a T-shirt today that's the E. coli with the DNA all spread out from it. Okay. Uh, I was trying to figure out, you know, if the, who took that class. We talked to somebody recently who was involved in taking that picture. There are a lot of electron microscope uh, images of phages, in particular T4, with the tail fibers kind of splayed out. Uh, but, the, you know, that's the phage uh, sort of stuck to a grid. And in solution, that may not be the, that apparently is not the way it ordinarily is. Right. right. Uh, and plus, it's the extrapolation of our impression from the grid. I mean, you see a couple of table, tail fibers stuck out, and you know there's six of them, and you know this thing has to sit down in the cell like that, so you make up the rest. You know, you interpolate. <laughs> mm -hmm. Interpolating and making up fine line between the two. <laughs> what is it? All <laughs> models are wrong, but some of them are useful? Yes. Right. Right. And part of so, the title of that episode was T7 Gets a Cat Scan. Right. Yeah. <laughs> right. And uh, 
you know, the thing, I, I pull this back up in science, and then at the bottom of that, they have, you know, other related papers that cited this recently, and, and one is a, a cool paper about uh, bacteriophage of a, an archaebacter, and in this one, it's called SIRV2, S-I-R-V-2. They uh, uh, attach to long filaments from the bacteria that are uh, pillus-like and to the end of them, and then they seem to maybe walk along or, or somehow then get to the surface of the bacteria. So it's maybe a recurring theme with different variations. Um, so it's both in the archaea and the bacteria. And I thought that was kind of cool. Neat. All right, Kathy, you also had pick number six. Um, well, I just picked these because I got ahead of you guys, I think. I certainly have had them. <laughs> yeah, I had so. also picked it. And on my list of ten, I had the T7 paper and this next one. So this is the sea gas uh, paper. And we talked a little about this, I think, just last week. Uh, but the sea gas uh, as a cytosolic innate immune DNA sensor. And uh, then, Vincent, uh, you can take it from here because you've already looked into some of the future or additional things that came from that. Yeah, so I was just interested in how much had been done because I figured this is one of these discoveries that is going to just stimulate a lot of people. And I found 15 papers. If you search for uh, sea gas DNA sensor on PubMed, you get 15 papers for 2013. So it's clear that a lot of other, and they're not all from John Chen, uh, by the way. James it's, Chen. James Chen. Um, it's not it's clear that this is something that is really going to take off. Now, there a paper was just published recently in Nature, which suggests that in addition to its role in sensing DNA viruses in the cytoplasm, it apparently plays some role in RNA virus infections as well. Hmm. And this was a paper in which the sea gas was knocked down or knocked out and the, then the cells uh, were, I think it was mouse model, were infected with various viruses. So that's kind of interesting. Why would a RNA virus trigger sea gas? So that's going to have to be something sorted out in the coming years, I think. Well, let me see if I can uh, reconstruct this. I'm, I'm doing this from memory. Uh, help me if, you, if, if I go astray. But this was two science papers in the same issue. Right. from the Chen lab and what they showed was there was a DNA sensor that is cyclic GMP AMP, a AMP synthase Correct. which binds DNA and is stimulated to take ATP and GTP to, uh, to synthesize a novel cyclic dinucleotide cyclic GMP AMP which until then I'd never heard of before really a weird molecule and that is a signaling molecule for downstream stimulating the sting pathway right which is a previously characterized uh, antiviral pathway and sets off a cascade of events that is antiviral I forget what the what the end uh, deal is so this was a path this was an IRF3 dependent stimulation so sting is required downstream of sea gas and then Eventually, IRF3 gets phosphorylated, it, and IRF3 ah, right. is a translation protein. It goes in the nucleus and turns on the synthesis of, of antiviral proteins. Right, okay. Yeah, because one of their major assays for this whole thing was di uh, phosphorylation and dimerization of IRF3. And this, the, the papers are amazing because They're amazing. the technology is just phenomenal. This is a very rare protein and was very difficult to pull out. And worth going back, if you haven't looked at these, take a look at them. Yeah, the, assay, the assays are brilliant. The the work in the in those papers was pretty spectacular. Mm -hmm. And looking at some of the more recent papers that was done, I found one where they showed that adenovirus infection is sensed by sea gas, and another where they showed that sea gas has to dimerize. So when it binds DNA in the cytoplasm, see the sea gas protein dimerizes, and that's required for its activity. So that's actually a common theme in, in sensor proteins. All right, very cool story. And that's another one which I think is going to be worked on for a very mm -hmm. long time. We'll probably see that again in 2014. Mm-hmm. Uh, our next story was also put on by Kathy. 
So this is the story from uh, Sarah Sawyer's lab about the transferrin receptor evolution. So this is a molecule that's encoded by the cell and it has to have a cellular function that's, uh, and, and it has to maintain that cellular function. But this molecule has been used by two different viruses as a receptor to get into the cell. And so Sarah's lab has done a really nice study of figuring out that there are domains of the protein that uh, are required for the cellular function that stay the same. And then in the region where the viruses are using this protein for receptor, the virus can mutate, uh, the receptor can mutate uh, and not affect its cellular function. So uh, it's a really good way that the cell has of maintaining this cellular function in the face of these viruses trying to use this molecule to get into the cell. By the way, Kathy, viruses can't use anything. I know. I <laughs> knew this was going to be a problem describing this. <laughs> but I'm sorry. I'm very sorry. I know. <laughs> But if that's the way some of us need to think about it, that's the way we're going to think. About <laughs> I, it. I think I think we can we can use that construct that viruses use things. No, that... you can't. You just, <laughs> Jane Flint will be after you. Well, she's already after me probably for a lot of things that I've said. So, oh can, well. You, you asked uh, in the show notes. Can, <laughs> would would Jane Flint allow us to say evasion? In I fact, know the answer. Is, the answer is no. We, this came up recently. I was at Princeton two weeks ago going over a chapter, and no, she would not allow us to use that. But of course, again, this is in the context of a textbook where the meaning of everything has to be unambiguous and clear. Right. So that, that's why this is an issue. Well, in right. my thesis, I referred to the behavior of poliovirus, so I'm sure that would have... That would, a good thing she wasn't on my committee. <laughs> Indeed. So, and I, I think you wrote a blog post about this too, Vincent. And I looked yeah. very carefully to see how you said it, and you kind of talked all around evasion. But, he evaded um, it. Yeah, I evaded it because I'm very sensitive. You do right you know, when you're in a meeting with Jane, and and you um, make her unhappy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she just starts shaking her head, evidently. Yeah. She shakes her head. She makes sounds as you're talking, <laughs> which is really. Uh, and then she has. Then she she takes her pencil and she makes huge streaks on the page with it. And <laughs> <laughs> she will. She will often break the point because she's pushing it so hard. Uh, I should actually record a session, video record a session of us doing this. <laughs> it would be really funny. Mm. Okay. That, that was a good story. The next one is also uh, picked by you, Kathy. Well, I just, uh, I think a lot of people picked this, the Pandora viruses. They were so yes. big in the public's imagination. You couldn't go anywhere when this first came out without seeing it in the news. And if you mentioned that you were a virologist, they would say, oh, those really giant Pandora viruses, those are so cool. So. Yeah, it's a big story. Yeah, huh. this this was going to be one of my picks too, but you'd already beaten me to it. <laughs> So we discussed it in 246, and then, Vincent, you went to the meeting of the giant viruses and uh, did the live TWIV 261, so people could get a double dose of that. Yeah, you should listen to 261, because there I spoke with uh, Chantal Abergel and Jean-Michel Clavery, who were the two senior authors on uh, that science paper where Pandora viruses were discovered. And you can hear right from their mouths how they did it and... It's a pretty good story. You know, and I noticed you met with them in a nice big room, so there was space for the viruses. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, how big are these genomes? These are like almost coli size, right? No, they're two and a half million base pairs. Two and a half million yeah. bases. Um, which is very big. It's bigger than many parasitic microbial genomes, you know, genomes of uh, bacteria that require other bacteria in order to survive. So that would be on the order of 2,500 genes. Yeah, that's correct. Now, the amazing yeah. thing here is that those 95% of those 2,500 genes have never been seen before by anyone. Ah. So, yes, as I recall, this goes back to this uh, idea that these viruses may represent viruses of a fourth domain of life that has since either disappeared or we haven't found it yet. Exactly. Right? Mm -hmm. I uh, I don't know 
how good those arguments are. Certainly the phylogenetic trees look convincing, but you know, you can phylogenetic trees you can do things with. But I I really like that idea. It's so mysterious. Yeah, it's and really I think good. that's actually um, the, the there were positive and negative reasons why this story I think caught so much public attention. The the negative reasons were that there were some some of these kind of wacky stories about a virus from Mars um, that I, I think we criticized the coverage on that. But um, but the the more positive take on this is the the same fascination that a lot of us as scientists have with these things that they're just so different from all the other viruses and the bacteria that we know and they they even even if they're not alien alien they look alien and they and it's an absolutely fascinating insight into um, stuff that we thought we knew we knew something about the notion yeah. that viruses could be a remnant of a whole domain of life that is now gone uh, just fascinates me. In, in yes. addition, in, in addition to that, the viruses have. It, it's as if, with that domain of life gone, the viruses have found a new home. Yeah, they, go, they went to another planet. <laughs> and it, it, it reminds me, um, kind of, of this uh, evolutionary story in wildlife biology. There, there are some um, herbivores, some prey species that have defenses that seem completely out of proportion to anything they need. Uh -huh. um, I, I think antelopes might be one of them. There's some some animals that just run way faster than anything that preys on them, and the predators still get them. They get the old ones, but the question is why are they so darn fast? And if you go back in the fossil record, you find that they lived on continents that had things like saber-toothed cats at one time that were probably much quicker than the current round of predators. So they're they're running from predators that don't exist anymore. And I think these viruses are evolved to infect hosts that may not exist anymore. And they've just, they've adapted to to other lifestyles, but they have all this baggage left over from that history and the, the hosts that they used to know. The cool, th the cool aspect of this story, which I came to appreciate by having gone to this uh, giant virus meeting, so there are two camps among people who study giant viruses. And, of course, they're not just Pandoras. They're the Mimi-like viruses, which are not at all related, by the way, to the Pandora viruses. They're completely different. Um, there are some people who feel that viruses, at least these big DNA viruses, originated as cells and broke away from the cells and took part of their genome and have since undergone genome reduction. And the Clavary and Abergel believe that. Uh, the other uh, camp believes that viruses started out small and acquired genes from other viruses or from cells. And if you listen to the podcast, you'll see that Jean-Michel and, and Abergel are very passionate about the, uh, the gene loss theory. But while we were recording, proponents of the other theory were in the audience and I could see them shaking their heads very <laughs> very vigorously and one of those proponents of the uh, the gene acquisition theory is Eugene Koonin who works at the uh, NIH in fact he's one of the main forces behind uh, the uh, genome part of PubMed and uh, I went up to him afterwards and I said well you know I'm in Washington a lot why don't I come visit you and we'll record an episode with your version of the story so he was very enthusiastic about about doing that it'd be great if sometime when we're covering some some thing like that where you've got two really interesting camps if you could get both of them on the show at the same time well I'll tell you there is I tried to do that at this giant virus meeting let me tell you a little backstory <laughs> so the original I identification of Mimi virus was done in the laboratory of Didier Raoult in Marseille. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the time, Jean-Michel Clavary was working. They had separate labs, but they were collaborating. But apparently, they have since um, ceased to get along, let's say. And now they work completely independently. <laughs> And, um, in fact, they don't often don't go to the same meeting, but it just so happened that at this giant DNA virus meeting, a member of the Didier Raoul lab was there, and I had asked him to go on TWIV with uh, Jean-Michel and Chantal. 
and at the last minute he said, Vincent, I can't do this. Hmm. So uh, I tried, but maybe... You know, okay, scratch that. Maybe it's not a good idea if they depends. really don't get along. <laughs> yeah, it's too bad because it would be a great, great to hear both sides of the science, right, mm -hmm. with compelling arguments, I'm sure, on both sides. would. Be and hear great. them simultaneously, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but you can do it. Doing it sequentially is almost as good. Oh, we'll try that. Yeah. Um, number nine is a fan pick. So I announced on our Facebook fan page, you know, does anyone have a a story for the year that they'd like us to discuss, and two people uh, voted for uh, the story of um, a cytomegalovirus-based HIV vaccine, and that was TWIV number 254, 99 macaques on the wall. Yeah. Uh, this was a very interesting story where they immunize macaques with a, uh, a vaccine based on rhesus cytomegalovirus carrying uh, proteins from SIV and they show they get in half of the animals you get complete protection you get um, very low virus loads and clearance in many of them so this was a very this was a story picked up in the press was very very well covered and um, I think that's a good story of the year also mm -hmm. definitely uh, and and this is uh, it, it's a unique concept in vaccination because the cytomegalovirus uh, establishes a latent infection in the host and therefore will be, as, as I understand it, continuously expressing these antigens for the life of the host. Um, and okay. so that, that really is a novel uh, concept in vaccination and may be the kind of thing that you need to get after something like HIV. Yeah, and I think also the, the, this, these vectors induce T cell responses primarily right. and that's a big part of it so I'm sure we're going to hear a lot more from that I mean dealing with the 50 percent issue why are only 50 percent of the monkeys protected was right. an interesting question and that and many other aspects of this will certainly be revisited uh, for our last pick the 10th uh, over on Facebook a couple of other stories were selected so one one listener picked the MERS coronavirus which we did pick another picked H7N9 influenza virus which continue as you see there are a few more cases now recently in China we've covered that a few times um, Fauci pharmacy and research funding was another pick that was um, a good episode mm -hmm. that was fun the Fauci that was pharmacy. great yeah. yeah and also a paper that we have not done but which I think we should do called pyroptosis in resting HIV infected CD4 cells so the mechanism by which HIV kills uh, CD4 T cells is apparently pyroptosis, which is a special kind of apoptosis. And I, I had a look at the paper. It looks really interesting. So we'll do that, but it's not something we did cover. So I thought we should really pick Threading the Needle as our 10th story because the movie was released in 2013. That was an amazing opportunity that we had to go inside of that uh, BSL-234 research facility. And uh, I just want to give it another push because I think it was a great opportunity. Yeah, that was that was a fascinating thing to see. I mean, however however you feel about uh, that particular project, that was a really really neat view that uh, that is not available anywhere else because all the operating BSL fours you can't have camera crews going into them. So it turns out that the that they have federal approval to uh, open up the lab. Um, and I put a link to a story where I found that. And apparently, they're going to start BSL-3 experiments soon, but they still need state approval to run as a BSL-4, and there's still some community opposition, so it's not quite clear yet when they're going to open up. You know, it's interesting because uh, when that controversy first erupted, and I've heard other similar ones, you know, one of my reactions was it, that it's crazy to put a BSL-4 lab in a populated area but then on thinking about it uh, there are uh, a lot of the major BSL-4 labs are in populated areas and there's never been a problem like in particular the CDC lab right in the, in, in the middle of Atlanta yeah so right. in fact we'll a, fed, a federal judge said that the public risk from the needle is quote extremely low or beyond reasonably foreseeable 
Yeah. Sounds like a lawyer, a lawyer, doesn't it? Yeah, <laughs> sure does. <laughs> anyway, speaking of BSL-4s, so as I've said a couple times, I'm, I'm visiting Australia next July. I'm going to do a couple of twivs there. I got an email from uh, Lin Fa Wang, who um, is a virologist who works on bat virology and immunology, and he invited me to his uh, BSL-4, which is about an hour from Melbourne, and he said he would take me on a tour and it says, what size clothes do you wear? Let me know so I, can get, <laughs> so I can get your suit ready. So I won't have a camera crew, but maybe we can do a twiv from inside that uh, BS, That's Australia's BSL-4. This sounds like a great trip, Vincent. Mm -hmm. It should yeah. be good, and I'm glad it's in July so I don't have to worry about uh, time constraints. All right, let's do some email. We do have a bunch left, and maybe, uh, Kathy, you could start with that first one. Sure. Shane writes, Hi, Vincent and Dixon. I'm completely up to date on all your podcasts, so I've gone back and started TWIV from the beginning. I'm up to TWIV number 60, which is a Virology 101, and a couple of things are not quite clear to me on flu replication. If you could answer these couple of queries, it would be much appreciated. Number one, does each minus strand have its own polymerase attached, or does one polymerase have to make mRNAs from each strand? Two, the enzyme that creates the full-length copy of the genome, does it make a full-length plus strand as a jig first? Is that enzyme in the virion, or is it made by one of the mRNAs? Thanks. Shane from Australia, speaking of Oz. So the question, uh, does each minus strand have its own polymerase attached for flu? Uh, I think they do, if yeah. I remember correctly. Okay, yay. That's correct. So in, that the, part. Yeah. <laughs> in the virion, each uh, RNA segment has the polymerase attached to it and has to because it's a negative strand and as it gets into the cell, the cell wouldn't be able to deal with it. So each, each strand has a polymerase, correct? Right. And then this next question, um, talking about the full-length copy of the genome, we have to remember that for flu, there are eight different segments that make up the, the full-size genome. Um, so, there, so a full-length copy of each segment does have to be made by the enzyme as a plus strand to then be made into a minus strand from that. But and there's so never any kind of catenated intermediate or anything like that. It's right. all, always segmented. Right, right. And, and so then the question is, is that enzyme in the virion or is it made by one of the mRNAs? So it's the same polymerase that's making the minus strand, or that's making the plus strand that then can make the minus strands. Is that correct, Vincent, or is there some modification? So in the virion, as it comes into the cell, that polymerase only makes mRNAs, even though it's, you know, it's four proteins uh, right. associated with the RNA. It, it only makes mRNA as it comes in the cell. And then you have to have the production of, ad of additional viral proteins, probably the NP, the nuclear protein, and probably something else, in order to get full-length plus strands made from, from each RNA. Okay. Right. But he's right. It's a good question. Mm -hmm. uh, it is made as a jig. I like that. <laughs> I like yeah, that, I like, too. I like that term because it's exactly <laughs> what's being done. Because mm -hmm. there's no other use for that plus strand. It's very interesting. It's only to serve as a template uh, for minus strand synthesis. Right. So the, what's the, maybe this is getting into it too much, but what's the difference between the full length and the messenger RNA? Are there like five prime and three prime sequences that are missing from the message? Well, the yeah, they're different. So the five prime and the mRNAs have a cap Stolen cap, stolen right? Stolen cap with 10 to 12 nucleotides from host mRNAs, so that's extra. Whereas the full-length plus strand has starts with just an A, APG, which is the first two bases of the mm -hmm. complementary strand. And then, of course, the three prime end of the mRNA falls short of the um, end of the genome, and it's also polyadenylated. Okay. I think it's 70 nucleotides short, or so, but don't quote me on that. And so, so. Uh, what I'm hearing is that you may need synthesis of new proteins like nuclear protein to assist in that switch in specificity from messenger RNA to full length? That's correct. The, I, I think one of the ideas is that 
um, the nucle as the nuclear protein concentration rises, it begins to coat uh, the plus strands that are made and eventually can act as an anti-terminator and allow extension of the complete. So that would be genome. really the same concept as in uh, other negative strand viruses uh, that are polygenic like uh, vesicular stomatitis or, uh, or, or other things. It's the accumulation of NP that gives you the switch from message to genome synthesis. That's right. That's right. Interesting. Okay. Uh, Rich, can you take the next one, please? Sure. Pardon my uh, picture, because in order to read this, I'm going to have to lean into my laptop. Oh, no. So you're going to get a close-up. <laughs> uh, Evo. Is that how you pronounce that? I-V-O. Mm -hmm. Evo writes, Hello, TWIV creators and collaborators. Since the holiday season is coming up again, I thought I would ask you a question about clementines and other mandarin oranges. Ah, yes, I remember reading this. I don't know how it is for the rest of the world, but during the holiday season in Scandinavian Baltic countries, clementines are at the peak of their popularity because gastroenteritis has also an increase around that time. Many healthcare workers have started advising people to wash their clementines before putting them on the table in fear that the norovirus can be spread through contact with the peels. Many people don't wash them as the peel is not eaten, but there is still a risk of cross-contaminating the edible part. I do agree that all fruits should be washed before serving. However, I've not found a lot of information on the norovirus and clementines. Is it a common path of infection? And uh, the concern is the concern relevant, or is gastroenteritis more common around the holiday season as people are more inside and together in groups? Is this a common problem around the world? I write you from uh, Vestros in Sweden. Vestros, that's how I pronounce that. Mm -hmm. um, the weather is still far from the white Christmas many people are waiting for, but it's getting colder with the temperature commonly being under zero degrees C. All the best. Keep up the good work. Evo, and he's at... Uh, uh, Mallardin University. Okay, so I actually sent this to my norovirus buddy, Stephanie Karst, um, who said, uh, I have never heard of a clementine-associated norovirus outbreak. Any produce uh, exposed to contamination, contaminated irrigation waters would potentially be a source, so it wouldn't hurt to wash, but it's not something I've heard recommended before. On the other hand, spread via vomitous particles on a plane can frequently trigger an outbreak, so we were less than thrilled when a baby in the row right in front of us, she's, she was on a trip, vomited the whole flight. Parents told us at the end of the flight that the uh, whole family had the same thing the past few days, so they didn't think it was motion sickness. Happy holidays. Great. I would, uh, so Stephanie, uh, who is quite an expert on neuroviruses, has never heard of a Clementine's associated uh, outbreak. I would, um, I think the reader is on to something where they ask whether uh, this could just be a coincidence of the season, because after all, this is winter vomiting disease, right? There is a seasonal aspect to these uh, gastroenteritis viruses. And also, this is one of the most common foodborne illnesses, and people are getting together for family-prepared meals. Right. So... I, I would suspect the salad rather than the clementines. Or, or Here in other. Oregon, we had uh, for dinner the last two nights 21 people, and we'll have 24 tonight. And wow. I'm just crossing my fingers. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Alan, could you take the next one? Sure. Um, Nick writes, Hi, Vince. I listened to and watched your recent TWIV from Tegrancy, uh, number 261. Very well done and interesting. You've become a real communications professional and are serving an important role, not only for the general public, but also for virologists. During that discussion, you touched on the question of the origin of viruses, which Claveri et al. believe may be uh, by capture of cellular organisms as parasites in a cell, then loss of function. This makes much more sense to me for the very large viruses. Will there ever be larger ones than 2.5 megabase mega Pandora viruses? 
However, there is no reason to believe that all viruses have a unique origin, as you alluded to in discussing RNA viruses. Viruses could even be originating in the present world. Why not? At any rate, I think there are good reasons to believe that viroids, retroviruses, single-strand RNA viruses, double-strand RNA viruses, small DNA viruses, and large DNA viruses may have each had distinct origins. I outline some of these reasons briefly in the second edition of my textbook, Fundamentals of Molecular Virology, um, and enclose a PDF file of Chapter 3, The World of Viruses, which ends with the discussion of the possible origin of viruses. Uh, you may have had TWIV sessions devoted to this topic, as I've not been able to follow your prolific TWIV productions, but if not, it might be interesting to plan such a session in the near future. For your information, another chapter in the second edition of my textbook covers very large DNA viruses, specifically viruses of algae and mimivirus, uh, this predated Pandora viruses. By the way, I have fond memories of southern Bavaria, where Tegernsee is located, as I spent a summer in Aachenmühl near Rosenheim during my second year as a graduate student at Rockefeller University, learning German at a Gotha Institute school there. I stayed in a farmhouse with local Bavarian farmers just up the hill from the small town of Aachenmühl. I didn't make it to Tegernsee, but visit, visited uh, Kimsee uh, a bit further south, or further east. Munich, Salzburg, and finally Vienna, and spent some gemutlich times in an Austrian bar, forget the name, in Kufstein, just across the border from Germany. A beautiful region with lots of history, some of it not so good, as concentration camps were also located nearby, and Hitler had a favorite castle there also. Uh, regards, and uh, Nick uh, is a uh, uh, professor at McGill University. Okay, what's gemutlich? Gemutlich. Uh, gemutlich is, uh, there's not a good translation, but it's happy, warm feelings. Oh, that's what you engender all the time, Rich, right? There you go. Gemutlichkeit. As long as <laughs> it's not what, a sense of, of equilibrium with the world. Right. No, that's what, uh, that's, what, that's what happens when you hang around in a beer hall and drink liters and liters of beer. <laughs> Okay. Right, with, with not you, only not only do you get uh, do you feel gemütlich kite, but you forget the name of the bar. So <laughs> Nick uh, uh, experienced all of that. So would you say that Twiv uh, is a gemütlich podcast? A absolutely. <laughs> okay. Um, so these were interesting things that came up. Uh, I asked uh, Jean Michel and Chantal. So where did RNA viruses come from? And they said, Nah. We have our hands full with DNA viruses, uh -huh. <laughs> so it's something we should we should talk about at some point. Maybe um, uh, our the the fellow in at NCBI, who's uh, Koenig, might might have some ideas. I think uh, uh, I think actually now that I'm thinking of it, I'm going to have to look this up. That Gemütlichkeit actually uh, implies good feelings towards your fellow man as well. Oh. But well I will we look it up. We for have him. we have that here on Twitter. We have that here too. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. In fact, some at some point we should have Gemütlich as, as a title in our project. <laughs> I like that. Just like we had, didn't we have Turducken in our title once? Yes, we right, did. Right, right. <laughs> right. So Nick is a, a polyoma virologist, and uh, so I knew him from the DNA tumor virus meetings. And uh, we have some Atchisons in my family history, so we determined that we might possibly be related. There's a lot of Atchison uh, mm -hmm. sub branches here in the U.S. Isn't Basically, there, was there was there a railroad too, like or a town spelled differently? Atchison, oh, Atchison, okay. Atchison, Topeka, and Santa Fe. Okay. Yeah, I knew Nick from the uh, mid '70s when I was. He, he was working on polyoma in Switzerland when I was working on polyoma in London. Mm -hmm. And Gemütlichkeit means a situation that induces a cheerful mood, peace of mind, with connotation of belonging and social acceptance, coziness, and unhurry. That's TWIV for sure. Nice. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. The next one is from Joe, who writes, Hi, all. A few episodes ago, Vincent mentioned that ASM has public lectures every so often. I live in D.C., so I was excited to hear this, though sorry to have missed the microbiology of beer lecture, as that has long been a pet topic. However, I've been able to find a schedule for these public events on the ASM website or on the microbe world page I get as a redirect. I'm probably missing something obvious, but would you mind pointing me to a calendar or similar? And I'll include a link to uh, ASM After Hours. It's right there on the microbeworld.org website. If you have time for a question as well... No, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta go. 
<laughs> I've been muddling over something and would love to hear your takes. During a discussion of HIV restriction factors, someone po posited that lentiviruses have been a major driver of primate evolution, at least recently, whatever recently means in the context of evolution. I haven't been too successful thinking of evidence for this, I'm sure due to my ignorance rather than a lack of support, but it popped into my head again while listening to your recent discussion of herbs in the MMTV episode. So if I may, what do you think of the idea that lentiviruses have driven primate evolution and what evidence do we have already and what other evidence would you expect to find if you were to look into this further? All the best this holiday season and thanks for your help. Now, didn't we talk about this with Harmit and with Michael Emmerman uh, in those two podcasts? Yeah, I think so. I'm forgetting the details, sorry. So basically, the, the idea is that the genome of primates ha encodes restriction factors which have changed over time, okay. and the idea is that lentiviruses have exerted the pressure for this change. And, you know, trim, I forgot the number, Tw trim, five trim 5 is one of them. Um, Sam HD1 is another new, more recent one that's been uh, talked about in this context. I think we even spoke with Jackie Dudley a little bit about this. Mm -hmm. So that's I think that is where the major evidence has come from. Um, you know, with the the change of lentiviruses, does that make sense? That that makes sense. The notion that those those uh, antiviral factors basically are uh, signatures of uh, uh, pressure imposed by lentivirus infections. Not only that, but the just uh, incredible number of uh, endogenous retroviruses that uh, uh, are a history of collisions with these uh, critters over time. In right. fact, the, the Michael Emmerman episode that you and I did, Rich, we talked about this extensively, I think, mm -hmm. right? So we'll put a link to that, uh, Joe. You should check that one out. I'm sure this is the the evidence is more extensive than we've just mentioned briefly here, but I think Michael goes into it uh, quite a bit. Well, this is a great question. This is something I'm sure we're going to revisit again mm -hmm. um, in the next year. Yeah. Uh, let's do another round, okay, of of emails, and that brings sure. us back back to Kathy. Okay. Lindsay writes, my name is Lindsay Hastings Spain. I'm a student at University of Maryland, Baltimore County, and an avid listener of your virology netcast. I have a question pertaining to the brief conversation you and Rich had on microRNAs during episode 238, Lost in Translation. As you stated, microRNAs bind to three prime untranslated regions and have been found to affect the post-transcriptional stability of the mRNA. In other words, just like transcription factors, microRNAs are master regulators of the cellular system. So my question is, should we expect to see promoter-like sequences, similar to what we see for transcription factors, for microRNAs within the three prime untranslated regions? And if not, then what is it about microRNA that allows them to regulate... <laughs> what is it about microRNA that allows them to regulate gene expression the way they do? Thank you so much for your time. I look forward to hearing your response. Best, Lindsay. So microRNAs that bind to the three prime untranslated regions uh, do so with varying amounts of perfect complementarity to sequence there. So for plant RNAs, the sequence complementarity is perfect, if I understand it correctly, and that leads to degradation of those messenger RNAs. For mammals, for microRNAs, the complementarity is not so good, but there's a sequence usually of something around two to eight nucleotides long that's called the seed sequence. And then uh, that partial complementarity can lead to uh, some accumulation of, uh, some inhibition of accumulation of protein sequences and also uh, in some cases maybe even uh, degradation of the RNA. Um, you guys can jump in there because it's not my area. And you quite uh, I got it. thrown off by the use of the word uh, promoter in this uh, email because I have a very fixed idea of what a promoter is, a, a sequence in DNA that binds proteins that trigger transcription downstream from that. And I my, my, my 
knee-jerk reaction was that that was a an inappropriate use of that term uh, in the context of microRNAs. However, the seed sequences, the target sequences in the RNAs for the microRNAs are what we call cis-acting sequences. They are sequences that stuff binds to and uh, trigger some sort of an effect. So in a, in a, in a broad sense, uh, the, the use of the word promoter is not uh, inappropriate. There's a, there's a sequence there that the microRNAs bind to and trigger their effect. Right. I, I took it to mean, is there some kind of, yeah, like you said, cis-acting sequence that defines where things should happen? Right. So, that, yeah, that's how I interpreted it. Right. Yeah. Good question. Yep. All right, Rich, can you take uh, the next one? Okay. David writes, you might like to know about this. Uh, and this is a link to, I'm just getting it up here again, um, one of these uh, community uh, uh, science laboratories. Citizen scientists done lab coats at Seattle's first do-it-yourself bio lab. So this is um, uh, a place where anybody can go and uh, uh, do biological science in sort of like do-it-yourself formats. We've done a we've done a couple of things like this uh, on uh, on Twiv, where you know uh, this is how you do it at home. Right. <laughs> mm -hmm. And there are a number of different organizations that have uh, put together uh, places where you can go and do this sort of community built do it do it yourself. Uh, science and this reports on one in Seattle. It's cool. This one is called Hive Bio. I think that's a cool name. Yeah, you can go and learn how to do stuff. They have these in the New York area as well. There's they're, one in San Francisco that I recall. Yeah, they're quite popular. There's a nice quote in here which I need. Uh, I can't resist reading. Um, someone says, "Where I've just oh, a lot of the press out there is oh my God, somebody in these community labs." or in their basement, is recreating the polio virus. <laughs> but people this don't realize a, how hard that would be to do, even yeah. if you had a million dollars worth of equipment. This is a, uh, it, it's a great way to uh, spread the excitement of science to the community. I, so I really laud this kind of activity. One of the things that comes to mind is one that I think it was a pick of the week we did one time on sort of homemade Bio tools, and somebody had made an Eppendorf centrifuge out of a, a Dremel drill, yes, and, uh, and a a little head that uh, held the Eppendorf's that was made on a 3D printer. Right? And I think that was that was actually being used um, for for some sort of diagnostic work in developing countries. Mm -hmm. uh, could be because the yeah. idea was um, it, it's not just people. Who want to do this in their garage, um, but there are a lot of people in the world who really need particular types of equipment in a lab and simply can't afford it. Um, and uh, and this was, I think there was even a paper about that one where the, the three D printed, cost, yeah, yeah, it can be can be done very low cost locally because um, the the key thing about a centrifuge is that the um, the rotor has to be precisely engineered, but Nowadays, with 3D printers and CNC machinery and such, you can precisely engineer things without uh, without being machinist. Uh, so I think that 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 type of concept is applicable elsewhere too. I th I think these are good things um, because it would give the public a better appreciation of what science is. Right. Yes. Right. And what sort it is not. Sort of a popular science approach. I have a yeah. something waiting in my queue for uh, picks of the week, which is. Uh, turning your iPhone into a microscope, same kind oh, of yeah. idea. Right. I mean, there are many people who, who are scared of this, as evidenced by that quote I read. In fact, Lori Garrett, at a meeting I was at with her last year, said that she's worried about these do-it-yourself bio labs as the source of the next bioterrorist attack. But I really, I disagree. I think they have far more benefit than than potential harm. Yeah. In fact, our next uh, letter from Gian is about a similar, this one is do-it-yourself bio, DIYbio.org, which is a greater organization, I believe, about uh, promoting um, 
promoting this concept in general. Yeah. yeah. Okay, uh, Alan, you are next. Okay. Um, Howie sends along a uh, definition of viri from uh, Urban Dictionary. Um, the, it's, quote, the product of a socially deprived 14 to 38-year-old individual with way too much computer time and no job. Uh, that's <laughs> referring to computer viruses, of course. They just ignore the real viruses, don't they? Yeah, uh, Kathy. Uh, so that yeah, the fifth definition down the page is ah. There you go. Hey, let's see how they define sick. it. A biological agent that replicates itself and causes harm to its host. Well, it doesn't really replicate itself, right? And it doesn't necessarily cause harm. Yeah, that's right. It shouldn't be in the definition or a computer program, <laughs> <laughs> which is. But they do say viral infections can be prevented through the use of vaccinations. So that's good. They get yeah. bonus points for that. Yes. Yeah. I don't really like their de definition of virus, and there are plenty of good ones out there. On well, the but this is this way. is just a community maintained uh, internet uh, dictionary, so it's whoever feels like putting up a definition, and then people vote it up or down. I think. Yeah. Too bad. Okay. Uh, the last one is from Neil. Who writes, in case you have not seen this, maybe you can dig out the recording of past discussions about Jenny McCarthy and replace her name with Katie Couric. Unfortunately, Couric probably has a wider audience. And many uh, listeners may know that Katie Couric had a discussion uh, in which she was presenting both sides of the argument about HPV, human papillomavirus vaccines. Both sides, as if there are two sides. <laughs> And she was roundly criticized for that. Uh, and and, there, and Neil sent a link to a wonderful um, blog post by our friend Seth Minukin, author of The Panic Virus. It's also an article on Forbes by David Kroll. Uh, and then apparently she, she has since uh, issued an, apo an, an apology, Alan? Yes, a totally inadequate apology that uh, just kind of... Kind of um hems around the point without accepting blame and and uh, yeah. Why did you do this at all, Alan? A viewership. Oh, I mean, you, you're dealing with somebody who um, this is this is somebody who deals in celebrity and uh, needs to get viewers for. I I think she may have a new show or just revamped her show or something. And uh, and controversy sells. And why not? Um, why not come up with something inflammatory? And so she came up with this. And um, yeah, really, really unfortunate. The HPV vaccine is absolutely one of the most, the, one of the safest vaccines out there. Yes. It's just protein. That's all it is. It's not, it's, it's uh, made by recombinant DNA technology. That's going to, uh, of course, scare a bunch of people. But all it is is protein. It never had any virus in it or anything like that. Uh, and not only is it safe, but it's perfected. This is a cancer vaccine for crying out loud. Yeah, yeah. And in fact, this is um, one of the one of the um, the interesting things about the Merck one, uh, Gardasil, I guess, is it's their it's their first big um, uh, you know vaccine that they've come out with uh, since Maurice Hilleman left. Mm. So, <laughs> um, and, and it's done. It, the thing is done in an entirely modern fashion, and it's the kind of vaccine that you'd like more vaccines to be made this way. Um, so, really, it's an example of how it should be done, and you know, maybe revisit old vaccines and revamp them the same way. If we could make flu vaccine the same way, that would be a great step forward. So Neil followed up with an email. Uh, sorry if you discussed this already. I'm way behind on my TWIV episodes. This is a mild improvement. Too bad you can't go back and make the millions of viewers unsee the original episode. So he sent us a link to... Uh, to the inadequate apology that, yeah. Apology, right. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I, I must tell everyone that uh, the FDA, in fact, uh, had Merck recall a, a batch of Gardasil vaccine Actually, uh, Merck did it voluntarily. Did it voluntarily. They, they, uh, they called the FDA because um, their quality control procedure had uh, uh, detected um, some time. One of their one of their 
machines that they they package it with um, had uh, you know broken in some small way, and they detected this after they'd shipped out a, a batch of vaccine. And the way that this uh, shook out was there could be very tiny particles of glass um, in the vaccine vial. Now remember, this is an injected vaccine, so you're going to stick a little needle syringe into it and pull the vaccine out, and not you're not going to inject people with this glass anyway. And if you did, it would be sterile and wouldn't affect anything. <laughs> um, so it's a it's a it's nothing to do with the vaccine itself. It's just the sort of thing that happens on a production line. And because it wasn't detected until this lot had been shipped, they recalled all of that. Um, and they've been very, very um, forthright about publicizing it. In fact, I've gotten, I think, six press releases about this thing. Uh, they keep notifying everybody, hey, you know, this this lot of vaccine, check your batches. It's lot number J007354, right. which uh, if you have an excellent doctor should have given you the lot number on your vaccination information. Right. And if you if you did get a vaccine from that batch, there's it it's fine anyway. It's fully immunogenic. You got vaccinated, you don't have to get the shot again. Um, and you know, if it causes a little additional irritation, then maybe you got a particle of glass, but probably not. Yeah, that'd be the worst that would happen, right? You'd get some yeah. irritation mm -hmm. at the injection site. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Still very safe vaccine. Yes. All right. Let's do some picks. We still have a lot of scrolling to do to get to them. We sure do. <laughs> but we're getting there. All right, Alan, what do you have? Uh, let me see. As soon as I get down to the picks, I went too far. Uh, oh, there we go. Um, so uh, my pick this week is a blog called Contagium. Um, and uh, this is... Um, it's a site I found a few months ago. Um, this is uh, uh, Dr. Torres Vieira, um, who's originally from um, uh, from Venezuela, and is now at uh, now in Miami uh, by way of several other institutions: Harvard, Beth Israel. Um, he is an infectious disease and public health blogger, um, and a, I think I initially found this because of his post on tulips. Um, it's got a, a neat thing about uh, the tulip viruses that cause the, the Dutch tulipomania. Um, and one of, the, one of the really cool things about this blog, though, is it's in both English and Spanish. Hmm. So mm -hmm. I know a lot of our listeners uh, have been looking for stuff, you know, Spanish materials and Spanish podcasts. Um, and this entire blog is bilingual, so you can get the. Uh, cool. uh, he's done all, all the posts. You you get the English version and the Spanish version back to back. Mhm. Mm it's cool. cool. Yeah. Yep. It looks like he's got a uh, a single podcast episode there. Yeah, I think the podcast hasn't really he, he hasn't kept up with it. And it's um, hard. It's hard. Yeah, it's a it's a big commitment. He does have a. Um, He's got a Twitter feed and a uh, uh, cool. paper.li uh, feed, so he's got some, some regular news postings well, as well. Yeah, we need to have bilingual podcasts and yes. blog posts. Cool. Yes. Rich, what do you have for us? Uh, I just want to boast about my Christmas present that came to me from <laughs> one of my daughters and her family. This is the Fast Lane Infrared 3 Channel Falcon Helicopter with Gyro. So this is a small, it's about, I don't know, four inches long, a small radio-controlled uh, helicopter. You see these things, you know, being hawked at malls and stuff like this. This one is, uh, I think, sold exclusively uh, by Toys R Us. Now, on Christmas's past, I've seen versions of these go by that are impossible to fly, and so you crash them the first couple of times, and they're broken, and they don't last past Christmas Day. This thing is amazing. And what's amazing about it is that it's got a gyroscope in it that uh, buffers all the movements and gives it uh, uh, incredible stability so that even I can make this thing hover and turn and go places and land, and it's just a blast. It's awesome. Cool. So cool. there you go. Go buy one. Yeah, those are great. <laughs> And this is going in my office. 
Okay. <laughs> now I saw your your pick uh, earlier in the week, and so that actually inspired my pick, which is a TED video that my younger son showed us uh, the other night. We were having a bunch of people over for dinner, and he said, "You have to watch this cool video. It's it's how the, now these are quadcopters, okay, which are really getting popular. They have four uh, propellers on them." And you can attach a camera, and you can, they can carry heavier things. But the cool thing about this video is that this fellow, Raffaello D'Andrea, has been able to program them and help them to learn, basically, help the copters to learn. It's a cool video where he demonstrates how you can play catch with them, they can balance, they can make decisions, and uh, do all kinds of, of very neat things. Isn't so, this the backstory for Terminator? <laughs> yes. <laughs> Eventually, they take over the world. That's right. <laughs> they become sentient, yes. Uh, so anyway, it's very cool. Um, take a look at that. But I, I did get a, uh, a cool Christmas present, which is not as cool as Rich's, but it's this, okay? Um, and it's just not... These are reading glasses, and they have two, two lights on them. Look, I just switched them on. Wow. Okay? <laughs> cool. Um, so when I'm always I'm always reading at night, I suppose, and I can put these on and see the books. So that's pretty cool. I don't know how stylish they are, though. You know, yeah. Let me put them on here. Uh, Ooh, hey, that's a little Terminator-like, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, that's, <laughs> that's, that's kind of blinding. Sci -fi. Yeah. So it depends what kind of style you're going to, going for, Vincent. Yeah, well, this is the studious style, I guess. Right? Very I'm not going for any style. I'm just. I didn't figure. No. <laughs> uh, Kathy, what do you have? Okay, well, I also have one of my Christmas presents. And uh, as a kid, I didn't have Legos. We had Block City, which seems like a forerunner in a way of Legos or maybe a, a takeoff. But in my stocking, I got a mini Lego uh, scientist. And so uh, I've just sent myself an email so I could uh, put the picture up to this camera also. But I've included it in the show notes. But here's... Here's my uh, <laughs> here's my uh, it's Professor C Boom. Um, it says on her name tag, and she's wearing purple, and I think the C Boom um, comes out to be Kaboom. Um, uh, and okay. if you mix the if you mix the blue and yellow liquids together, maybe it blows up. But the really neat thing was that uh, we've had several discussions at various points on the show this year about various issues with women in science. And in the whole mini Lego collection, there's only this one scientist, and it's a woman. So I just think Excellent. that's really cool. Yeah. Excellent. Very good. I, I like I the love, fact that she's holding two Erlenmeyer flasks. One great. Each I love yeah. the Erlenmeyers. The Erlenmeyers yeah. are beautiful. They're very cool. Nicely yeah, I, done. I got to assemble that, you know, so that was fun. Yeah. All right. We have two listener picks. One is from Lindsay, who writes, Dear Twiv Gang, I'd like to submit a listener pick of the week. Hopefully no one has beaten me to it. And I think this could possibly be a contender for an Ig Nobel, especially when the person I received it from started the email with, it's not fake and it's not the onion. <laughs> but with a title like, Moderate Alcohol Consumption Enhances Vaccine-Induced Responses in Rhesus Macaques, I still did a double take. It's the perfect excuse to have one more drink at the holiday party for your immune system. Of course. <laughs> I just thought of a great way to boost immunization coverage on college campuses. There you go. <laughs> That's right. So moderate, apparently moderate alcohol is good for boosting vaccine-induced responses, but excessive uh, consumption is not. Chronic alcohol intoxication suppresses your vaccine. <laughs> okay, scratch response. that idea. So don't so, drink too much. It has to be moderate. So, so when you go to your doctor, you ought to get a vaccine and a, a tequila shot or something like that? Well, apparently. I always said, you know, a glass of red wine a day is good for you, but that's not for this reason. I've also heard lamentations over the lack of access to some of the papers discussed on TWIV, especially for those not affiliated with a university. There is one route I haven't yet heard mentioned. Large city libraries often subscribe to services like Academic OneFile, and have access to a number of scientific publications, though some, like Science and Nature, have a one-year embargo. Even if you aren't a resident of the city itself, you can still get a library card. I lived in the suburbs of San Francisco and Seattle, and both libraries allow residents 
of the larger metropolitan area to get a card. Best of all, once you have a card, you can use it to access article databases from home. I only found out about this in the last year, and I hope this helps some of my fellow listeners who are interested in reading the papers you discuss. And as per tradition, I'd like to report that it's 32 Fahrenheit, 0 C, and cloudy here in the Puget Sound area. We're expecting a storm tonight and into the morning with forecasts of freezing rain, warm, wet snow, or some combination of the two, depending on who you ask. My morning commute should be very interesting. Wishing everyone happy holidays, Lindsay. And uh, a second from our friend Johnny, our pediatrician friend. Check out this video on YouTube. And this is the singing microbiologist. This is great. Posted over uh, at Microbe World. Mm -hmm. And this is a professor from Yale who uh, writes songs and sings them to teach microbiology to his students. It's very good. You should check it out for sure. Um, he's not yeah. a bad singer either, right? Yeah, his name is Sheldon Campbell. And I already wrote to him. And uh, he wrote back because I was asking him a little about the uh, uh, public domain songs. And I was thinking of having my uh, having our students in our class do this as one of their out of class uh, options. Is uh, write a couple of songs, and if they were going to end up on YouTube, we'd want to make sure that they were public domain. So it's nice he's already written me back, and I, I had given him a little heads up that it was going to be on uh, Twib and would probably virally spread because of that. So. Yes. Uh, that's a good idea for an extra credit to have. So you would have them actually perform the songs? Yeah, Yeah, and I think, you know, if they were shy, I'd offer to sing along with them, or we could pass out the words if there were choruses, you know, things like that. So we're going to have a couple of uh, out-of-class options for them. Some are uh, to do some reviews of TWIV papers and, and things like that. But I had my graduate students in a, in a graduate virology class do this about 15, 20 years ago. And they wrote either kind of rap poetry or songs um, to sort of help remember different virus families. So uh, it was fun. Yeah. That's a good idea. Yeah. Of course, don't forget the Twiv rap. The right. Guys, you guys remember that? Yeah. Yes. It's really yeah. cool. Mm -hmm. That was great. All right. That'll be it for Twiv 265, our last for 2013. You can find this episode and all the others at twiv.tv and also on iTunes. And if you like what we do right now, what you can do to help is to go over to iTunes and leave a comment or a rating, and that helps to keep us visible so more people will find our cool stories about viruses. Send us your questions and comments to twiv at twiv.tv. Kathy Spindler is at the University of Michigan. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks. This was fun to hang out. I'm trying to remember to look at the camera. It's hard. <laughs> Yeah, it's okay. It, I think the video adds something. It's kind of cool. We had a couple of uh, viewers all along the way, but I didn't really promote it or advertise it. We could mm -hmm. probably have had more. Alan Dove is at turbidplaque.com, also on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Always a pleasure. And uh, Rich Condit is at the University of Florida. Thank you, Rich. Sure enough. Always a good time. Enjoy that skiing out there. You bet. You're coming back next Friday, is that right? I, I Yes. When you're broadcasting next Friday, I will be in transit. Okay. So I won't be with you next Friday. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. And I want to thank everybody for listening in the past year and keep on listening in the coming year. And also to everybody, a, a really, really happy new year. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Viral.